We'll start. I don't know whether you guys see anything or not. That's your problem. Hello. Hey. So, uh, Eugene, sorry, we're just trying to get something sorted out here. Oh, I can't see. Thank you. Uncle Eugene, can you confirm what you see on the screen? Yes, thank you. Thank you. All right, sorry. I got to thank Jasmine, my technician, to help me with this technology stuff. Yes, Jess. What's that? That's your slides. That's Zoom. We can see it. Everyone can see the other image. But I want to change the other image. Yeah, well, use your pointer. No, I haven't got it. Oh, okay. I hope you can all see on the screen. Yes, all good. Okay. Tonight we continue the study of Revelation. And we begin the study of the uh, seven seals. Now you notice I've entitled this, I hope you, ha hope you have received a good seal. Now that, that uh, title does not come from the prophecy of the seven seals as such, but it comes from the Day of Atonement. And I read to you from a book called The Messiah in His Sanctuary by F.C. Gilbert, a converted Seventh-day Adventist minister over 100 years ago, who was converted from Judaism. F.C. Gilbert. And F.C. Gilbert, in his book, The Messiah in His Sanctuary, I read to you a quote he makes from the Jewish Encyclopedia about the Day of Atonement. And he says, at the close of the services on the Day of Atonement, the people would clasp each other by the hand and offer one another the glad expression, hope you have received a good seal. And that's how the Jewish people would greet each other at the end of the Day of Atonement. I hope, hope you have received a good seal. I think as we proceed through this study, and especially as we go into the closing um, sessions, you will begin to understand how meaningful this is, this expression, as a close to the Day of Atonement. So I hope you receive a good seal at the end of this study. Now, We've broken it up into six sessions. Tonight we look at the throne room of God. Then we look at the seal book, the four horses, the fifth and sixth seal, the seal of God, and the final session, the 144,000. So tonight, let's go into it. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. After this I look, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. The voice like a trumpet, the voice of Jesus is often Thessalonians 4, 16, the trump shall sound. Come up. Come up is a important, come up hither. To understand the prophecies, we must be lifted up into heavenly places. Our minds must be taken above this world. 
if we continue at the level of this world's understanding, we will never understand the prophecies. We need to come up. We need to be lifted up into heavenly places. Now notice it says hereafter, things which must be hereafter. This implies that this prophecy, unlike the seven seals, which also has a local application, this prophecy, this is a pure prophecy. It is prophetic. The things which must be hereafter. The seven seals said the things which are and the things which shall be. In other words, double application, a local and a prophetic. Whereas the seals, it's just purely prophetic. Here, after, from here, and after. And notice 4.2. Immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Notice Revelation 1.10. John was taken into the spirit, and then he was shown the messages to the seven churches. Again, he says, immediately I was in the spirit, indicating that this is a new series of messages and a new vision. After the message to the seven churches, he must have been, uh, there was a break, and then this one was then given. That special state of awareness that God takes prophets into that he may show them the messages he wants them to co convey to the world. <clears throat> now John is shown the throne room of God. He says, behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. And he says, he that sat on upon a throne, uh, sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in the sight like unto an emerald. Now jasper is a translucent stone of various colors. The different colors, but especially that of fire or red. Now of sardine stones, there were two special variety, one of yellowish brown and the other transparent red. So obviously, to be looked upon as jasper and sardine, the common colors for these two stone is red or fire red. So obviously, he that sat on the throne looked red or fire red. Hebrews 12, 29, our God is a consuming fire. And that's the thought that is conveyed by this vision of the one who sat upon the throne. Now the rainbow is like emerald. Emerald have a green color. So it's strange. We know that rainbows are multicolored, ranging from violet all the way to, oh, what, all the way to red. But this rainbow is strange. It only has one color. And that is green. Why? Well, if you study the colors, green is a cool color. Green and blue are cool colors. Red, oranges, they are warm colors. All right? They get the blood, uh, raise the blood uh, temperature. Green, blue, they cool you down. They're cool colors. And Revelation, uh, Psalm 23, verse 2 conveys this thought. Maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Green symbolizing rest. Now the rainbow. The rainbow was first given as a symbol of the new covenant made with Noah. Not only with Noah, but with all nature when God promised he would not ever destroy the world again with a flood. 
And Isaiah takes that thought <coughs> in Isaiah chapter 54, the 7 to 10, and he refers to the rainbow as a symbol of mercy and of justice. <coughs> mercy and justice brought together. <coughs> Now, round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats, John describes four and twenty elders, twenty-four elders, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Well, as you've seen over and over again, white denotes righteousness, so we won't dwell too much on that. Crowns of gold. Crown of Righteousness, 2 Timothy 4, 8. 24 elders, we'll leave that for uh, later on in this presentation. As we come back to that. But notice it says, Out of the throne proceedeth lightning and thundering and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Again, the Holy Spirit is referred to as the seven spirits of God. Seven complete throughout all the sequence of events. The Holy Spirit is overshadowing, controlling, working, doing what only he can do. Seven, again, complete sequence of events. As we saw with the seven churches. The sequential nature is often not understood. People say seven means complete, but 10 also means complete. The two numbers both mean complete, but seven is a complete sequence while 10 is complete at that point in time. 10 homes are pe 10 kings that exist at the same point in time, whereas seven heads don't exist at the same time. They exist in a sequence of, of uh, uh, events. Now before the throne, there was a sea of glass and the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Now the sea of glass, if you turn to Second Chronicles, if you quickly turn to Second Chronicles chapter 4, your Bibles. And verses 2 to 6. We see in Solomon's temple. And also he made a molten sea of 10 cubics from brim to brim, round in compass and five cubics the height thereof, and a line of 30 cubics did compass it round about. And under it was the similitude of oxen which did compass it round about, 10 in a cubit compassing the sea round about. Two rows of oxen were cast when it was cast. And it stood upon twelve oxen, three looking towards the north, three looking towards the west, three looking towards the south, and three looking towards the east. And the sea was set upon them, and all their hinder parts were inward. Here is a description of the laver, or referred to as the sea of glass. Why is it referred to as a sea of glass? Because in Exodus chapter 38, verse 8, when the Israelites were told to donate for the sanctuary in the desert, the women donated their looking glasses, which was made of brass, and that was used to make this laver. All right? The mirrors. What is a sea of glass all about? That's where the priests washed before they went into the holy place. That's where they washed before they entered the holy place in the daily ministry and before they even went through the holy place into the most holy and high priest himself. The sea of glass was mirrors. James likened the law of God to a mirror, which when you look in it, 
it tells you what you need to do to fix up your appearance. The water is referred to as the water of his word. We are washed, washed. Where the priest does his washing, so too must we be washed. Now the sea of glass is the opposite of the troubled sea. Isaiah 57, 20. The wicked are like the troubled sea, which cannot um, stir up mire and dirt. Whereas in Psalm 21, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters, peaceful waters. So the sea of glass represents the washing of the saints, the result is we are at peace with God and with the universe. Now the four beasts and the 24 elders are located around the throne of God. Now we will look at those four beasts. Now we see something here, a table. John sees four beasts, Ezekiel sees four living creatures, and Isaiah sees seraphims. I, I, this table compares their vision and how they describe it, the similarities and the differences. All right? John says the beasts were full of eyes, or an alternative translation in the Greek is shining brilliance. Shining brilliance. Ezekiel describes the four living creatures as the color of banished brass. Okay, brass that has that is shined, polished, so that it really shines. Isaiah does not mention their appearance at all. John calls, says these beasts had six wings. Ezekiel, they have four wings. In Isaiah, the seraphims have six wings. Verse four, uh, the fourth uh, point, the beasts cry, holy, holy, holy. Ezekiel doesn't mention what they utter. Whereas Isaiah, the seraphims cry, holy, holy, holy. John describes the beast as a lion, a calf, the face of a man, and the flying eagle, respectively. Ezekiel describes these four living creatures having four faces, the face of a man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle, similar to what John saw. Isaiah does not describe the face of the seraphims. He says their faces were covered. So here are some similarities and here are some differences. Okay. Now Revelation 4, 6, the 24 elders and the four beasts. Now notice in Revelation 5, 8 to 10, the four beasts and the 24 elders sing, Jesus is worthy for he has redeemed them and made them to reign on earth. Now the very song they sing indicates where they came from. First, they have been redeemed. Second, they shall reign on earth. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth, Jesus says. <clears throat> So this tells us where the 24 elders and four beasts came from. They're not four beasts in heaven somewhere. They have been redeemed from this earth. Now, if we look at the camp of Israel, when they camped in the desert, and you'll find this described in Numbers chapter 2 and 3. We had the most holy place at the very center of the camp. The most holy place and the Ark of the Covenant was located in the very center of the camp. <coughs> then the holy place was on the east of it. Their one building. And then east at the entrance to the tabernacle, 
because surrounding the most holy and holy place is the courtyard, and at the entrance to the temple or the sanctuary, on the east side was a camp of the sons of Aaron. These were the priests. And then surrounding the sanctuary, closest to it, were the families of the Levites, the Merorites and the south, on the north, the Kohathites on the south, and the Geshonites on the um, west. These were the four families of the Levites that camped closest to the sanctuary. And then further out, we had the camps of the Israelites. We had on the east the camp of Judah. And each camp contained three tribes. So Judah was in the camp of Judah, and together with the tribe of Judah was Zebulun and Issachar. So that was the camp on the east side of the sanctuary. On the south, on the north side, we had the camp of Dan. And together with Dan was Naphtali and Asher. So the camp of Dan con consists of those three tribes. Then on the west was Ephraim. And together with Ephraim was Benjamin and Manasseh. And on the south was a camp of Reuben, and together with Reuben was Gad and Simeon. So these were, this was the arrangement of the camp of Israel whenever they would camp in the desert during the 40-year um, journey through the wilderness from Egypt to the Promised Land. Now that's important we understand this, because each each camp had a standard. In fact, each tribe had a standard based upon um, the uh, comments of Jacob on his dying bed and Moses before he would pass on. And Judah, the standard of the camp of Judah and the tribe of Judah was a lion. <coughs> this is why Jesus is referred to as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. <coughs> the standard of Dan was of an eagle destroying the serpent. Now, Dan was described as a serpent, <laughs> but they took an eagle destroying the serpent or eating the serpent as their symbol. Now, Ephraim was an ox, as he is described in Deuteronomy 33, 17. And Reuben was a figure of a man. As in Genesis 43, 9, 3, it says, let his men. So these were the four standards of the camp of Israel. And then we have the 24 elders were the priest and the tribe of Levi. Now, when David arranged the temple services that Solomon built, and David was inspired or shown these things, the plan and all the services under the Holy Spirit's guidance, he was shown these things. He divided up the Levites into 24 courses, and they had to minister two weeks of a year. So 24, you get uh, what? No, no, sorry. Two months. Oh, no. Two weeks. That means 12 months. You cover the whole year. So they would rotate. So one group would come and minister in the temple in Jerusalem, while the others were out in the community, in the various synagogues, doing the work of the gospel and they'd have turns, 24 courses. That was the arrangement. So what are we looking at? And so Jewish tradition just backs up what the Bible says. Judah, the east was a line of gold with a scarlet background, 
Ephraim was an ox of black on gold background. Reuben was a man on gold background. And Dan was an eagle on gold with a blue background. The eagle was um, consuming or just, uh, eating a serpent. So the four beasts were redeemed from earth. That's the first point. So they must be people. They must be human beings, sinners who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And the 24 elders also. Because you cannot sing that song unless you have been redeemed. Now Proverbs 30, 13. The four beasts symbolize certain characteristics of Jesus. The lion is strong above all creatures. So the lion symbolizes the strength. The strength of God. As Jesus said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. The symbol of a man, humility. Philippians 2, 5 to 8. Let this mind be in you, which was, in, which was also in Christ Jesus. And you notice he came down. From being equal with God, he stepped down even to take on the form of a servant and made in the likeness of men. Christ came down. The ox service, the gospel service, Matthew 5, 7 to 18, 17 and 18. Ah, sorry, 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18. Matthew 11, 29 and 30. Take my yoke upon you, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your soul. And the eagle symbolizes the walk of faith. Isaiah 40, 31, they shall mount up with wings as eagles. Deuteronomy 32, 11 and 12. Exodus 19, 4, God says he has brought them as, um, as a mother eagle teaches her young, so God has brought them out of Egypt. Okay? It's a way of faith. And as the eagle leads her young and teaches her young to fly, so does Jesus leads us in the wilderness. So I want you to notice the camp. At the center of the camp is God. And those camped around are the people of God who reflect the character of God. They are... Uh, as Acts chapter 15, 14 and Ephesians 3, 10 tells us, they give glory to God by reflecting his character in this world. You've read this many times. The scene in Revelation chapter 4, this is the whole, uh, the theme of the seven seals. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. That's the whole message of Revelation 4 and the four beasts and 24 elders. Notice the song they sing, Revelation 4, 8 to 11. Quickly turn to Revelation chapter 4. Verses 8 to 11. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within. And they rested not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. We've studied those phrases before. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, <coughs> who liveth forever and ever, <coughs> notice the four beasts and 24 elders fell down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, 
Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. The four beasts and 24 elders, they give praise to God the Father and the Son, and they give glory. How can you say, holy, 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 just with words only? This is not just words only. Their lives are a reflection of the holiness of God. In their words and in their actions, in all their conduct, they say, holy, 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 brothers and sisters, that's what we are be, to be taught to do at this point in time of the world's history. God is calling for you and me to learn to praise him, not just with our mouth, but with our lives. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which it was and is and is to come. He is the Almighty, as you know. And so they praise God, not just with them lips only, but with a demonstration of righteousness as the world has never seen before. This is what God is asking of you and me today. And he's not just asking for us to do it in our own strength. He's saying, trust him. Turn to him, rely on him, believe in him, have faith in him, and you will learn to sing this song, Holy, Holy, Holy. Notice, thou art worthy to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things. A reference to Jesus as our creator, who created all things. And so, brothers and sisters, Revelation 4 is one of the most important chapters in the Bible. Right there, God, the message of chapter 4 is, brothers and sisters, be one you need to be in there. To be part of the people of God, we need to be the surrounded, the sanctuary. God is at the center. We give glory to him. We sing holy, 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 not with our lips only, but with our lips and our lives and all that we do. We give glory to God. Whatsoever you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. And how are we able, how are we able to do this? You know, if, you were to ask me, is it possible to be perfect in Christ? My answer would be two things. It's impossible, but Jesus makes the poss impossible possible. You cannot do it on your own. You need the power of God. You need the creative power of God. As David said, create in me a new heart. Renew a right spirit in me. When he, when he wrote his song, Song of Repentance, Psalm 51. And I want to give you, a, I want to leave you with you a thought here. Just a little thought, a little gem of truth and made me realize the need for the seven spirits of God, the Holy Spirit. The first question I will ask you, and you answer this in your heart. Can we ever fully understand the law of God? Well, if your answer is yes, then all I can say is you're deceived. You're deceived. Why? Because the law of God is a description of the character of God. To understand it, you need to understand God fully. And unfortunately, we are limited in our knowledge. We will never get to the place where we fully understand the law of God or the character of God. 
we will be studying throughout eternity and growing in the knowledge of the love of God, the character of God, the law of God. So remember that. David would say in Psalm, I have seen an end to all perfection, but thy commandments are exceeding broad. In other words, he's saying, as much as I understood what it meant to be perfect, your commandments are broader than that, exceeding broad. It's beyond my understanding. And so the next question I ask, how can you be perfect when you don't, cannot perfectly understand the character or the law of God. I struggled with that for many, many, I should say a couple, many years, until it dawned on me. We can be perfect, even though we cannot perfectly understand the law of God. And the only way we can do that is if we have someone to guide us who perfectly understands it. And who is that someone that is given to help us be perfect, even though we may not fully understand or appreciate? That's the seven spirits of God. That's the Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus sent him. That's why we must depend on him fully and totally. Even when we don't understand, just do it when he speaks to your heart. Just do it. And that's how you become perfect in Christ. Never out of Christ, impossible. In Christ, I can do all things. Brothers, that is why we need to depend fully on God, on the guidance of His Spirit, on the strength of His Holy Spirit, that we may give glory to God, that he may wash us clean as David. He may create in us a new heart, renew in us a new spirit. And at the end, we will sing holy, holy, holy and give glory to God. May God bless you. And I uh, invite you to pray. Now, I'm not sure if we'll have time for questions and answers, but I leave that to Uncle Eugene. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you tonight. We can spend some time studying the book of Revelation. So much to learn, so little time to do it. But you can teach us more in a moment with your spirit than we can ever learn in a lifetime on our own. So please teach us. Thank you for your kindness and love. Thank you for the wonderful illustrations you give that simplify the truth, that give us that which is necessary knowledge that we may give honor and glory to you and sing holy, holy, holy. Father, bless all who have tuned in tonight. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.